Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's uh, episode of Food Systems in Season. I think everything is working correctly and we're steam streaming and uh, recording correctly. So my name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service in Hernando County. And my co-host for today is Wendy Lynch. So Wendy. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome back for another episode of Food Season Systems and Season Fall Edition. We've got a great show for you today. Um, some great topics on uh, 4-H Food Challenge, which we'll be sharing here in a moment. And we've got Gerilyn Sachs, as well as Shana Johnson, who are going to be sharing all things food, sis uh, food systems related when it comes to 4-H Food Challenge. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Wendy said, uh, my name is Gerilyn Sachs, and I am the Central District 4-H Regional Specialized Agent. And also joining with this first half of the presentation is Shana Johnson, the Sumter County 4-H agent. And we are delighted to join you today. We're going to begin with a short video about the Florida 4-H program and all it has to offer uh, to youth and volunteers across the state. And then um, once we finish that video, we're gonna go in a little uh, bit more in depth about one of Florida 4-H's newest projects called the Florida 4-H Food Challenge. So let's get that video rolling. Our youth is what will lead us in tomorrow's world. It really is very heartwarming to see how much they grow and learn by being a part of 4-H. 4-H is the world's largest youth development program. We exist in all 50 states and in over 80 countries. We exist, I like to say, to help young people become better human beings. We help teach life skills, leadership, citizenship, and again, just help young people find their sparks and how to become contributing citizens. Originally, 4-H started as a mechanism to teach young people the skills they needed in life that they weren't already getting in school. In school, they were learning things like reading and writing and arithmetic and things that were important. We exist to help young people explore whatever their passions are. I honestly don't know where I'd be without the 4-H program. It's taught me so many different life skills. When I got involved at such a young age, I saw my peers getting up and leading meetings, doing good in their communities. I knew that's something that I too wanted to do. So fast forward quite a few years, and I got heavily involved in leadership and agriculture. Those passions not only helped develop me as a person, but gave me a lot of direction. Now I'll be attending the University of Florida, pursuing a degree in agricultural education and communication. That's something that I never would have found without the 4-H programs. I really think it's set me on a great path in life, and I'm thankful for a lot of the experiences that I've had. Florida 4-H itself typically reaches around 200,000 young people throughout the state of Florida annually. One of the things I think is special about 4-H is they find their place in 4-H. Well, they do all the things, right? They do band, they do sports, they do dance, they also do 4-H. But some of our young people, this is where they find their place. This is where they find their community. And that is so important. We talk about the essential elements of 4-H, and those are mastery, belonging, generosity and independence. Those four cornerstones all young people will experience in our programming. That's really what we strive to in this community, make sure that all young people have a place to belong. Being part of the council has been very beneficial. We're more familiar with the decision-making process. We have an executive board. I've done a lot of different things in 4-H, from things like woodworking to raising cows to raising pigs, chickens, dogs, the forest ecology, marine ecology, robotics, you name it. I've done it in 4-H in some capacity. The great thing about that is while I may not know what I want to do, I know what I don't want to do. And I think that also narrows down what you want to do in the future. Being a state officer, we get to plan meetings and each officer has their own event to lead. So this year I led Day at the Capitol, which is an event in Tallahassee where about 900 youth come and participate and learn a little bit about the legislative process and get to talk to their senators and representatives. And so I got to plan that event and get hands-on experience and learning how to plan and talk with adults and get that process rolling. So I think a lot of it um, transfers quite a bit. Extension is a partnership between the University of Florida and each of the counties in the state of Florida. Extension offices have different program areas like agricultural and natural resources, family and consumer sciences, and 4-H youth development. So we're at the Alachua County Extension Office here in Newberry, and this is a brand new building that we just moved into in October of this past year in 2021. 
It's been really great to have some meeting facilities, a great teaching kitchen that the youth can use, a lab. Our master gardeners have some great facilities to grow plants and do their plant sale. Get the kids involved in things that they're interested in while also teaching them life skills. One of the programs that we have here in the Gainesville area is our 4-H University program, a week-long college and career preparation program on the Florida campus. Through the leadership skills that we're giving them and helping them to acquire, can really, through their innovative minds, creativity, think about ways of benefiting their specific communities. Maybe they are not exposed to cattle or some of those things. It's important for them to understand that we have new technologies and new advancements in technology uh, that could be used to help deal with some of the issues that we're having. There is an annual membership fee to join 4-H of $20 in most cases. We do offer scholarship programs, so there's never a reason that any young person can't be involved in our programs. The other way that we really reach a lot of young people in the state of Florida are three residential 4-H camping centers. We have three camps in the state of Florida. We have Tim Pucci up in Niceville. We have Camp Cherry Lake in Madison, Florida. And then we have Camp Cloverleaf down near Lake Placid, Florida. And those see hundreds and thousands of 4-H and non-4-H young people ages 8 to 18 every summer who learn about how to better care for Florida's land, soil, air, and water, which is extremely important to the, you know, the entire state. You can be fearful coming into a new program or a new event. Maybe that you're surrounded by people that you don't know, and that can be pretty scary. The one thing that I always focused on, you don't want to have any regrets. 4-H can fill a lot of different needs in a lot of different communities, and that's what's so special about it. You can make 4-H what it needs to be for you, and that's what I've, I've, I've enjoyed most throughout my time in the 4-H program. So if you're a young person and you want to get involved in 4-H, the quickest and easiest way to do so is go to florida4h.org, and there's a quick and easy button, and that will take you directly to the contact information for your county. You can contact your local county extension office, and they will help you from there. Our primary push this year has been for 4-H camps because our camps need some new funds for building up the facilities and creating a better experience for those kids in the new facilities. We're always in need of 4-H volunteers, whether that's a day-long volunteer or you want to contribute longer term. We exist because if you can change a child, you can change a family. If you can change a family, you can change a community. If you can change a community, you can change a world. And it sounds very cliche, but it's true. We start with the young people. And so if we can change them, we can make our impact on the rest of the world. Awesome. Okay, so as you can see, the Florida 4-H program has a wide variety of learning opportunities for youth. And we're always seeking those caring adults to step up to uh, to share their uh, their interest and their um, skills to, to share with youth. Um, but today for the first part portion of this uh, series, we um, would like to tell you a little bit more about the Florida 4-H Food Challenge. And so I'm going to pass that on uh, to uh, Shana. But actually, before I do that, um, after watching that video, was there anything new you learned about 4-H? If there was, if you'll put that in the chat box, after seeing the, the wide scope of what 4-H has to offer, if there's anything new you learned about 4-H, if you'll please put that in the, share that in the chat box. We'd appreciate that. All right, Shana, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Okay, uh, Ms. Wendy, could you hit the next slide? So each year, more than 6,500 um, youth statewide participate in Florida 4-H uh, food preparation and nutrition related 4-H projects. Uh, so it's a very already um, popular uh, project area for our youth. Um, but we've come up with this new contest here in Florida. Um, it started, I think, in Texas. Um, and so this will be the, our very first year having this contest here in Florida. Um, it provides a fun yet challenging food-focused learning opportunity for youth ages 8 to 18. I like to tell people it's kind of like Chopped or MasterChef. Um, and it's really fun. So I've done it myself through workshops. I've helped teach some workshops of, um, both to both youth and adults at this point. And they all have fun with it. Um, they just, 
everybody that does it seems to really enjoy it and have a good time. Um, and um, youth work in teams of three to four. So they're the next few slides will kind of have some pictures so you can see here um, they're in the same age division and they're challenged to create a dish using a predetermined set of uh, ingredients and cooking utensils and equipment. Um, first, each team plans and prepares one of the randomly assigned dishes while being judged on their food safety skills, teamwork and abil ability to manage their time and resources. Um, and when they're done, youth present their finished dishes and deliver a five minute presentation and answer question about their dishes to a panel of judges. Uh, can you hit the next one? Okay, and so there you can kind of see some teams with their creations. I think those were at 4-H uh, University this past year in Gainesville. And we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so then how do we connect this um, event to the real world? Um, why is this relevant to our kids? Why is this important? So the way that we kind of um, communicate this to other adults is, have you ever got home from work and you're looking in your pantry and it's like, what am I going to make for dinner tonight? Um, and so here we've put <laughs> every day, Miss Wendy says, <laughs> here we've got a picture of a, like a cabinet or a cupboard and some other fresh food items on the counter. And so our challenge to you is to take a minute and think about what you would make um, using the ingredients pictured. And what we want, would like for you to do is type it in the chat box, but don't send it yet. Um, we're going to give everybody kind of a minute to think about it, come up with something yummy, and then um, send it in the chat box. So um, we're going to give you just a second, and then I'll say to go, and then we'll have everybody kind of send it in the chat box. So. I think we should even challenge it more and say limited uh, food ingredients, but also limited time because oh, yes. <laughs> in 30 minutes, they've got to make it, uh, out to the soccer field with their, uh, their two children. So a yummy and quick dinner, because these kids do this challenge. They only have 40 minutes to, uh, come up with what they're going to make, make it, um, and prepare their presentation. Plus do some math. That's, and it's pretty difficult math. I think even the adults have have some challenge with um, determining the serving size and the cost per serving. It can be it can be tough. So th they have to get a lot done in only forty minutes. Do we have to use all the ingredients to make our dish? Nope. You can select. So okay. whatever ingredients. These are the ingredients available to you. What do you want to use from what's available um, to make whatever? Okay, we got people answered in the chat box. So we'll go ahead. If you haven't pressed enter and you've been waiting, go ahead and press enter. So I see spaghetti and bean burritos. Let's see, I have a notification flashing. We have tortillas. Vegetable soup, Dr. Samuel says. There's spaghetti. Cold beans and pasta salad. Egg omelet. There we go. I'm very proud to see we're doing balanced meals. We've got some yes. veggies, some fruit, some grains. It makes my healthy heart happy. Having to use the beans for protein source. Three bean salad, Hasselback potatoes. Wow, you guys are really creative. Cool. So, I mean, and just in that, just in the answers that I've gone through so far, um, you can see that uh, every person can come up with something totally different. Um, and we're all looking at the same set of ingredients. I might have said something completely different from what you guys said. Um, I definitely wouldn't have come up with like three bean salad and uh, Hasselback potatoes for sure. That wouldn't have been on, on Shana's radar. So it give, really gives up the kids an opportunity to opportunity to express themselves um, and be creative with this challenge. So it's it's really fun and really lets you kind of see, you'll be surprised by what people come up with. It's really fun. Okay, and I think we'll go to the next slide and I'll turn it over 
uh, back over to Gerilyn for a minute. Okay, so this is the the 4-H, what we call the life skill wheel. And, um, you know, 4-H is all about that journey and that process, the journey of learning and all the skills that youth develop through that process. So even though the food challenge culminates to a contest, it's that journey that they, all the skills that the youth develop through that process, through that process. And so just by uh, taking thinking about the skills that you had to use to come up with that plan for your supper by looking at those ingredients um, when looking at the life skill will, what were some life skills that you felt that you had to apply? Um, I'll do one as far as like problem solving. So maybe you didn't have quite all the ingredients of what you needed, but maybe you substituted. So maybe you, um, you can't really see, um, I have a, a thing of ricotta here. So maybe I don't have ricotta cheese, but I have cottage cheese or I have um, yogurt or something that I could use. So again, applying those life skills such as problem solving. So put in the chat box, what skills, what life skills you felt like you applied to that activity when you had to come up with your menu. And I can't see the chat, but um, I bet we have some input, problem solving, wise use of resources, yes. Planning and organizing, decision-making. Exactly. And all those skills are what make our youth uh, that prepares them for the the workforce and prepares them to make good decisions with their own life and such. So uh, through the four through four H project work, such as the food challenge, youth develop a wide variety of life skills, such as the ability to make healthy lifestyle choices, wise use their resources, wise solve problems, work as a team, plan and organize. And research shows that children who have cooking experience have healthier dietary habits, and that their attitudes toward cooking predict diet quality. So preparing for and participating in such programs as the Florida 4-H Food Challenge provides a positive hands-on educational experience that prepares youth not only for that activity of the food challenge, but prepares them for their future. All right, Shana, I'm going to pass it back to you. So um, the last thing that we want to leave you guys with is that every county has a 4-H program just waiting for caring adults to step up and get involved. 4-H um, is run primarily by volunteers. And the video that we watched at the beginning kind of touched on that. Um, there's one or two agents per county. Maybe they have program assistance. Maybe they don't. Um, and so we really depend on volunteers. There's no way we could have the successful programs that we have without our volunteers. So if this is something that interests you, um, or if you just want to be involved in 4-H in general, uh, please reach out to your county agents. Um, and I'm sure that they will, they will provide you with the opportunity to volunteer. They will be excited to put you to work. Um, as professionals and volunteers, we act as caring adults for youth who provide and we provide a safe and inclusive environment that allows them to pursue their sparks or their passions uh, with the end goal of instilling valuable life skills into youth, resulting in youth who become productive members of society as adults. And that's really what 4-H is all about. Um, so again, if you're interested in learning more about 4-H volunteer opportunities, please contact your local 4-H program for more information. So. Thank you for joining today's session. And at this time, I think uh, Gerilyn and I are gonna turn it back over to Wendy and Bill. Thanks for having us, Wendy and Bill. Wendy, you're on mute. Go me. <laughs> That was awesome. So I hope you guys have some questions.
um, for our, not only for our 4-H experts today, but our other experts that we've had throughout the fall season. I know we did miss out one week due to the hurricane, but we've got folks here. There's Norma joining us. Um, and I know Lynn's on. So if you have questions about, oh, is she still with us? Um, where we had goats, cheese making, gar vegetable gardening. So if you have those questions, you've got the experts here to answer it. Let me drop the chat. Let's see. Hey, Luann. Hi. All right. So I'm not seeing any, but we'll give you guys just a few minutes to type in the chat if you have any follow up questions from our previous sessions. Um, we could always ask Norma what's growing in her garden. Yeah, sure. Norma, what's growing in your garden? So um, this past weekend, we just recently. Um, planted all of our brassicas. So we had started the seedlings about six weeks ago. So we now have planted in the garden kale, collards, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, all those things. So we like to wait until um, it starts to cool down a little because even though you can start to plant them around September, um, early October, it's still a bit warm at that time. So you'll have to contend with a lot more bugs. Planting them about this time of year, it's cooler, so there's less insect problems. And so it's typically just monitoring them for insects. And at that point in time, you can handpick. And we typically don't have to spray any pesticides once we plant, when it begins to get cool and we just monitor for pests throughout. That's great. Norma, would now be the time to, to uh, plant lettuce? I'm hearing that lettuce may be a shortage. Have you heard those things? Is that something we should be uh, planting? You can plant lettuce now and spinach also. Okay. Mm -hmm. Onions, you can get your onions in the ground now too. But if you're gonna be planting onions, you wanna make sure that you're planting short day onions and not long day onions. Long day onions is what you plant up north. Mm -hmm. But here you wanna plant short day onions. When you go to the store and you're looking for onions, um, it may not say whether it's short or long day and you may just pick it up, take it home to plant. And then you notice that it doesn't bulb at all. And it's probably because you got long day onion. You can also plant chives too at this time of year. And I was just telling Bill and the, and the team before we got on, I just had a delicious broccoli mixture salad and it had lots of onions in it and it was delicious. So yeah, I, I'm a big lover of onions. Yeah, and I, and I have broccoli going in my backyard garden right now also. Broccoli, kale, lettuce, a few other things. We all just need to bring it all together and have one big potluck. There you go. That's right. So I do have a question. Um, well, actually, Laura, did you notice the goats were in the 4-H video too today? I don't know if you saw that. That was a Yay. good connection to our series. I have a question about cheese making. So if you're a newbie and I knew, and you did address this a bit, Luann, but what would be the easiest starter cheese to make? Um, I'd say the mascarpone. You just stir those two ingredients together and stir them together on low heat until it's thick. Um, even though we did the mozzarella, Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a challenge for people, a lot of people. Um, you know, the other, the ricotta is a lot like cottage cheese. Mm -hmm. A lot of it comes down to what you're going to eat though. You know what sure. I'm saying? So, but the ricotta, the mascarpone is the, the basic, most simple one. And we didn't cover the aged cheeses because mm -hmm. um, of the concerns related to food safety and aging them and a lot of the bacteria around. So if you want to get into that kind of thing, start with the basics first and work up to it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to ask Lori kind of what her take on that was too. Yeah, please do. 
Um, yeah, I would agree with Luann. The other one that's uh, an easy one is queso fresco. So it's a soft white cheese. And there's a lot of different uses for it. And it'll take on whatever flavors you're pairing with it. So your tacos or quesadillas or any other delicious dishes. Perfect. Thank you. So we got a question in the chat from Mark. And this looks like it might be a normal question. It says, just a quick question about the onion bulbs. What is the best way to help bulbs develop width wise? Um, says he pokes his finger around them to give them some space. That's my kind of, my kind of gardening. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is a good, that is a good one. So um, the soil preparation is, is gonna be very important and also, um, Fertilizing the onion, fertilizing before you put the onion bulbs in the ground. Um, you can use a fertilizer that's um, you know uh, high in, in 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 potassium and phosphorus, low on the nitrogen at first. Um, and I'll put some more information in the chat, but it all depends on your fertilizer regimen. Your fertilizer regimen is going to help with whether or not the, your onions bulb, and also it helps with the taste of the onion. So I'll drop some information in the chat on the fertilizer regimen for onions. Thank you. Any other questions? I know Geraldine and Shana are still with us if you have folks that are youth that might be interested in the food challenge or other 4-H programs, or if you would like to be a volunteer. Well, I thought the 4-H uh, video was great. I thought it was very, very well done. And I really like the young man who said, it's important to find out what you don't want to do. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> exactly. Um, it's one of those videos that it's a feel good video. You can't stop smiling. So. Yeah, if I could jump in and say, I really enjoyed the 4-H video also. And um, my last one just started college. She's a freshman. And so she has been, you know, reaching out to me every time she does a presentation in class. And she would go back to, you know, the skills that she learned from presenting in 4-H and how she's able to utilize those skills now. So if you have young ones who are shy about speaking, 4-H um, will help them build those skills. And these are lifelong skills that will take them throughout, you know, college and, and their careers. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Samuel. And um, I, as a county agent, have had 4-Hers come back after uh, leaving for college, and a, a lot of them are required to take a public speaking course or speech class. And some of them have come back and said, their professor said, were you in 4-H? So um, their skills definitely uh, shined and uh, are identified. We have lots of opportunities for public speaking, definitely in 4-H, as well as so many other things. And I noticed that Brandon White just joined us a couple minutes ago. So if anybody has any questions for him for fruit crops or Roselle, which is what he spoke about the other week. And I know a few of you shared um, some of your sorrel recipes and that was super exciting that you implemented those. Um, and a lot of folks still reached out for the handouts, which were found at the end of the survey. So thank you for reaching back out. Um, anybody else try a new recipe with the sorrel? If you did, drop it in the chat. Well, I saw how easy it is to grow. I'm going to have to try growing that next summer because there's not a lot, an awful lot that you can grow during the summer. I did sweet potatoes this past year. They did very well. And uh, calabasa squash, I think uh, Roselle's another summertime crop. I know Norma's grown Roselle before. I have some green beans in my garden. 
Um, and they, uh, the leaves on the bean plants are just getting eaten up. And my husband has sprayed like soapy water on them. So what would be a good solution to uh, save the beans from the insects that are eating the leaves? You need to try to figure out exactly what kind of insects are eating it. So you're going to look very, very closely, turn the leaves over. If the leaves are being eaten up, there's a good chance that it's caterpillars doing that. If it's caterpillars, you're going to actually see and find a caterpillar. It might be very small, might be a very large one. But if you see caterpillars on it, um, there's very effective, very safe to use controls for that. You want to look for a product that contains something called BT, that's short for Bacillus thuringiensis. Goes under the name of Dipel, Thuricide, Organic Caterpillar Killer, things like that. And that's very safe to use. That's going to control caterpillars without injuring or endangering you or your pets or children or anything else. So look a little bit closer and try to find the exact culprit that's doing it. And then once you know exactly what's doing it, you know, we know what is going to help control it safely. Um, if I could jump into Bill, um, a common pest that we have in beans is Florida is the bean leaf roller. So when you're scouting, as, as Bill recommended, you're looking at out there in the garden, looking at your crops, you may see some of the leaves uh, touch together. And when you open them, you'll find that big, lovely caterpillar inside there, depending on the size. Um, but that's a, a common problem that you'll find. And you can just squeeze, if you don't want to look at the, the, in the caterpillar itself, you can just squeeze the, um, the leaf and squish it without even having to open it and look at the bud. <laughs> <laughs> We've and seen if you that only have a few, if you're comfortable <laughs> with it, you can just pick the caterpillars off and I throw them over the fence into my neighbor's yard. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> All right, so I just posted the um, the fertilizer regimen. So it's actually 10, 10, 10 at first before planting. And then you're using your side dressing every few weeks with an um, ammonium sulfate or ammonium nitrate fertilizer, okay? And we do uh, have a question, go ahead, Bill. Oh, I was going to say, I think we have a question here for Brandon because it has to do with fruit crops. So Brandon, uh, we have a question. My 18-year-old blueberry bushes and thornless blackberry bush not planted near each other, both have rust and was wondering the best solution. Uh, yeah, so from a, from a homeowner standpoint, there are some, so I work with commercial folks, so the, the pesticides are a little bit different. Um, rust is a pretty common one. Uh, there are some off the shelf fungicides available for them at the big box stores. Um, I would just, I would look for, for those rust being a fungus, um, and, uh, check the label for, uh, for blueberries, fruit crops, uh, and for, and for rust, but there's, there's some readily available ones, um, off the shelf there. Bayer makes some, um, um, from an organic approach or a less, uh, a less serious approach, um, not serious, but less toxic approach. Um, there are things like copper, uh, copper products uh, that they can use that they would also be able to find at the big box stores. And I will also comment that uh, things like horticultural oils um, and horticultural soaps, uh, safer brand soap is one. Um, are also good for kind of uh, a wide um, uh, array of, of chewing and piercing, sucking insects related to the green bean question. So I placed in the chat the source of my onion seedlings. There are lots of other places that you can get onion seedlings, but I placed the source that I use if you're interested in using that source. Norma, were they still available? I know sometimes it's difficult to find onion plants. A lot of companies sell out very quickly. Yeah, Dixondale, they specialize in onions. 
And what some people typically do is that they would team up with friends and buy their onion sets from them. And you get a, a lot of onions for, a, you know, for a small amount of money, well, reasonably priced. So, and the quality is very good. And even if you order the seed, the onion sets, you can put them up for like a week or two before planting. Yeah. So I'm going to drop a link in the chat. And so this is for the food systems in season um, central district mailing list. So if you are interested, you want to be alerted for upcoming sessions that we'll have um, in 2023. This is the way that you'll get that alert pretty quickly. Um, and again, it's just a quick, it'll ask for your name, email, and your county. And then we will send you those updates as we get some of those classes scheduled. But I wanted to um, throw that in the chat before folks left. So I have a question for our FCS crew. Um, what are some of the things that in season now that you're going to have on your Thanksgiving menu? Go for it, Lori. <laughs> you the girl that cooks a lot. <laughs> um, well, uh, we are going to, um, my personal green beans at home are not ready to harvest, but we are going to have some green beans um, with um, some orange glazed green beans um, that I made at a local farm. Um, we are going to do a cranberry and orange uh, sauce, but I also have some of that sorrel um, uh, glaze that we made. And that is gonna also be another option uh, for something new to try on our Thanksgiving plate since I froze it because it freezes really well. <laughs> uh, and those are a few. And then some roasted veggies, some seasoned roasted veggies, lots of color on the plate. I was hoping you weren't going to leave out sorrel, Lori. So I got you. I, <laughs> I got ready. you. Don't worry. I haven't forgot all you taught me. <laughs> Luann, any favorites for you? Well, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. Nothing's ready in my garden, except I still have some peppers that keep coming on and some tomatoes. I love a relish tray and I hope to do like a broccoli slaw. And um, I'm look, really focusing a lot on the vegetables. I have company that's not coming that's never been here before. I'm not sure. So I'm just doing all kinds of fruits and vegetable things and um yeah, and really focusing on that for the most part. I my didn't do sweet potatoes this year, but we, we'll obviously have some sweet potatoes and, you know, some of the traditional things too. And I dropped a link in the chat um, for crops in season for and that's specific to Florida. And then there was also a question about loquats, about preserving them and freezing. So I sent, I dropped the link in the chat about freezing loquats. And then I believe there's one, there's a loquat jelly that we can, I'll drop that one in the chat also for you. I've heard about loquat jelly and jam. I've never tried it myself, but I've heard it's quite good. I haven't had it myself either. I don't know if anyone else has tried it. If you have, I'd be curious to, it's super sweet. Unfortunately, sweet, most of the jams and jellies, when you read the recipe, involve a lot of sugar. So they all turn out pretty sweet. This is true. So I will say we just had, we have several of our offices right now that are, um, providing home food preservation classes, water bath canning and pressure canning. So be sure to check your uh, local extension office. Um, and sometimes you might come and visit. I know some folks have driven counties over to see Lori at her office for home food preservation and Luann as well. And um, this month here in St. John's County, we are in December rather, we, we're gonna have a pressure canning class and then also another water bath canning class. We're gonna make a holiday festive jam. And then probably again in January, I've got another pressure canning class. So if you're interested, definitely reach out 
to your local extension office, or you can reach out to Bill and I, and we can get you connected for sure. Ooh, we're getting all kinds of resources dropped in the, in the chat. So someone asks if it's too late to plant peas. So you can plant um, like English peas and snow peas now. Those are the two varieties that you can plant now in, or the two kinds you can plant now in Central Florida. And so I dropped the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide link in the chat. And with that, oh, Brandon did too. <laughs> So it's their toy. It's their it's mine. Toy. So with that, depending on where in the state you're joining us from, you can see what you can plant when. And there is another question in the chat about anyone having a problem with, they think it's ants, um, piling on the green beans and basil leaves. That one I am not familiar with. That is out of my scope. So I'm going to have to pass it over to our other experts. But I definitely, um, you know, our experts are on the same page when they're dropping in the same uh, resources. <laughs> oh, okay, so, so, so something. Oh, it's, are you saying that it's, they're in the soil? I can comment on that one a little bit. So there's not, um... You can soil on the leaves. Hold on, I'm, I'm reviewing the question. I just saw something else come in. So is, is it still windy on the same page? It's still ants? Okay. Uh, Norma just sent a link there that seems like it's ants. Um, so maybe check that out. But uh, so I, I, my garden at the house, I keep organic. So ants do not like uh, strong vinegar or oil. Um, so I'll spray them. Uh, inside the garden, and I will get some ant killer, the common ones you get from Lowe's and Home Depot, big box stores, and I'll put that outside of the garden to kind of bait them outside that way. That's my approach. And I, I just dropped a link from the competition Clemson University <laughs> in the chat, <laughs> in the chat um, on controlling um, ants in the vegetable garden. And I'll go ahead and drop that same link in just a second. <laughs> we have experts and wittiness we got this all right so we're it doesn't look like we have any other questions we'll give you guys another minute if you want to write those in the chat if not we can wrap things up I don't see any other questions in the chat. So one final thing back to the sorrel, if you um, are looking for something other than cranberry sauce to have with your turkey, certainly use some sorrel. You can make some sorrel relish to have with your turkey instead of cranberry sauce. So that's a great option for you. And don't ask me for the recipe. I just toss things together <laughs> when I cook. <laughs> that's what Lori was for. She provided, a, what were the mm -hmm. three recipes you, you did? I did a sorrel relish, a sorrel dressing with the sorrel salad and um, the sorrel tea. Yeah, that's where she comes in. <laughs> Glad to be of help. <laughs> With an assist from Brandon. <laughs> All right, any final thoughts or um, any folks have questions for Laura, for our goat expert before we wrap it up? Brenda, you can just send us an email. I'll drop my email in the chat and I can get those to you, the recipes. And because we are recording this at some point later on today, 
We'll email everybody the link to the recording so that if you want to watch it a second time, if you joined late, if you had, you know, got interrupted, you'd be able to watch the entire thing all the way through. Awesome. Well, I think that's that's a wrap, you guys. Thank you all for being here, all of our experts and 4-H for being here to uh, share with us a little bit more about the Florida 4-H Food Challenge. Again, reach out to your local extension agent um, or county offices if you have further questions, whether it's vegetable gardening, raising goats, chickens, bees. We've done it all, it seems. Um, but feel free to reach out to us or to Bill or myself. And again, we'll get you connected to the right place. So thank you all for being here. And we hope to see you in 2023 for our next um, episode, next round of episodes. And thank you for joining us, Nicole. <laughs>